been an interesting trend that has emerged in the last several years for those who identify themselves as Christians, and it's called deconstruction. And the idea is that all of us reach a point in time where we are assessing our faith, which is healthy. Nobody should believe anything blindly. But for, for many who identify themselves as Christians in this assessment period, they begin to decide, I don't think this faith works for me anymore. And so they begin to dismantle it piece by piece. What exactly is the Christian faith. Here's how the Apostle Paul answers that question. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, he says, You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. You know, occasionally at this church, we sing a worship song, Christ alone, cornerstone, comes from this passage right here. And the idea is that when they built buildings out of stone, the mason would lay the cornerstone first. And this stone would determine the direction of the rest of the build. It was the reference point. So anything that goes on top of that is in reference to the cornerstone. And so I want to illustrate it to you uh, like this. This is a, a visual representation of what the Apostle Paul was talking about. So these blocks represent the building blocks of the Christian faith with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. And so what happens with deconstruction is at some point, the, the person who calls himself a Christian starts to say, I don't know if this works for me anymore. What I believe determines how I behave or how I behave determines what I believe. And typically deconstruction starts when you already answer the question, uh, what I behave determines what I believe. I don't know if I want Christ at the center anymore. And so what we have to do is we have to start taking this faith apart piece by piece to make it look like something that works for us. And in my experience, the first block that typically goes is somehow connected to sexuality. I don't think Jesus cares whether I'm gay or straight or queer or trans. Besides, I really want to sleep with my boyfriend or girlfriend. So there goes the biblical view of sexuality. Yeah, but what about all those Bible verses that, that talk about it? They shouldn't do those things. Well, the Bible's kind of an old book written for people a long time ago. I don't know if it still holds true anymore. And so I'm going to just go ahead and take that block out too. This is the, the biblical authority block. And... That one doesn't hold up anymore either. And Christians are always talking about sin, how people are so bad. Well, I've met a lot of people who are not Christians, and they're really nice people. So I don't know if that holds up anymore either. So out comes the biblical view of sin. And so little by little, we just keep pulling it apart to make it work for us. And this could happen over a period of days. It could happen over a period of weeks months, years, or in an afternoon after watching TikTok videos and thinking this is what everybody thinks. And we just keep pulling the faith apart. And then eventually, we got to deal with this one, the cornerstone. Hey, look, love Jesus. Seemed like a great guy. Great example. I, lo I love how he, he, was, he was really compassionate. He cared about people. I love Jesus, but... He's not the center of my life. And once you get rid of the cornerstone, the whole rest of the system falls. And then what happens is we stand over the rubble of our faith. And we say, look at me, I've deconstructed. <laughs> now I'm one of the, the nuns, not N-U-N, N-O-N-E, as in none of the above. It's the fastest growing segment in American religion today. When people are asked, hey, what do you believe? They say none, none of the categories. And I've watched people deconstruct their faith in public and on social media. And without fail, there's always somebody there to go, man, congratulations. We're so glad that you broke free of this rigid Christian faith that is judgmental and Eurocentric and oppressive to women. Congratulations. And what concerns me is I, I, I'm watching people deconstruct their Christianity, but what I'm finding is what they're deconstructing is a version 
of Christianity, but it's not the real thing. So what is Christianity really? What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, rather than take my word for it, let's look to God's word to guide us. So if you have a Bible with you, we are going to begin in the New Testament book of Acts chapter 11. Turn to Acts chapter 11. And after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, it became very dangerous to follow him. As a persecution broke out, there was a, a young believer by the name of Stephen. They stoned him to death, and then they started trying to stamp Christianity out all over Jerusalem. And so followers of Jesus went on the run. They fled the city. They fled the country. And that's where we pick things up in Acts eleven nineteen. It says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. And so this gives us an idea of just how far people spread. Phoenicia, that's modern-day Lebanon. Cyprus is an island nation to the west of Lebanon. Antioch is in modern-day Turkey, although today the city goes by the, the name Antakya. And some of you may remember that city because uh, a year ago, February, it was devastated by an earthquake. Our church contributed money to help the aid workers on the ground there. And so the, the, the believers in Jesus went to these places and they were telling others about Jesus in this place, but, but there was a catch. They were only telling their fellow Jews. So a couple of believers got a wild idea. Verse 20. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. They thought, Here, here's, a, here's a crazy concept. Let's start telling non-Jews about Jesus too. And of all places they did this, it was Antioch. Here, here's what you should know about Antioch. This was a booming city, known for its thriving economy and rampant immorality. You went to Antioch for business. You stayed in Antioch for pleasure. And it was in this dark city that these followers of Jesus began spreading the good news about Jesus. Jesus and his death and his resurrection. And what happened? Verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. Good news always travels fast. And so some of the followers of Jesus ran back to Jerusalem, ground zero for persecution, which is kind of like the headquarters of, of the followers of Jesus. And they said, hey, you're not gonna believe this. Revival has broken out in Antioch. Antioch? Really? Jews are believing in Jesus in Antioch? Uh oh, not Jews. Greeks. Are you kidding me? And so this church decides to, to send one of their best guys to go be the campus pastor there. This is what happens, verse 22. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Barnabas was a gentle-spirited man who lived up to his name. His name literally meant son of encouragement. So he shows up in Antioch. He sees all these people converting to Christ. And what does he do? He just starts encouraging them. But he also realizes, okay, this is a lot of work. And I'm going to need some help. And so he rolled the dice. Verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. You know what the ironic piece is? Saul was the one who sent people running out of Jerusalem. He's the guy who launched the persecution. But then God got a hold of his heart and he saw Jesus and had a dramatic conversion himself. And now Saul and Barnabas for a year are just building up this thriving church in Antioch in the heart of a place known for its indulgence in money and sex. And the result was many people came to know the Lord. And here's your fun fact for the day. Verse 26, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. See, prior to this, followers of Jesus were referred to as disciples, witnesses, followers of the way, saints. But here in Antioch, they started calling them Christians. You see, in Latin, when you add the letters I-A-N onto the end of a word, it means that you identify yourself with the leader. So, for example, Roman soldiers who followed Caesar referred to themselves as Caesareans. 
And so some people were so moved by these Jesus people in Antioch, they started calling them Christians or Christians because they saw that these people totally identified with their leader, Jesus Christ. He was their Lord and Savior. Now, these days, the word Christian has devolved a little bit. It seems to be the word we use to describe people who are moral or religious. In fact, according to a study at the start of 2023, 70% of Americans claim to be Christians. That means if you collect 10 random people off the street and bring them in the room, seven out of that 10 would say, Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. Now, you know that's not true. But lots of people use the word Christian as part of their identity. Now, of course I'm a Christian. I believe there is a God. Of course I'm a Christian. I was raised Catholic or Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or Seventh-day Adventist. It's all the same, isn't it? Of course I'm a Christian. I attend church every single <clears throat> Easter. Now, I mean, <laughs> the word Christian has come to mean a lot of things, but... In the Bible, the word Christian literally means of the party of Christ. It means I totally identify with the leader, Jesus Christ. He is central to my life. And so if you are going to be part of the party of Christ, a Christian, there is some essential things that you have to believe. But it's more than just belief. How do we know that? We read it earlier, and I want to read it again. Acts eleven twenty one it says, The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. What is that all about? Well, let's break these things down, uh, belief and turning to the Lord separately. Let, let, let's start with believe. What is it that one must believe in order to become a Christian? A Christian as defined by the Bible. Well, I want to give you two essential beliefs. These have to be in place correctly. Number one, you have to have a right view of Jesus. And number two, you must have a right view of self. You got to believe in the right Jesus, and you have to see yourself accurately in light of this right Jesus. Let me tell you a fictional story about a man. We'll call him William. So William was raised in a family that never went to church. They didn't adhere to any religion. And William, his parents died when he was very young. And William grew up to be a, a very angry man. And by the time he got to his 30s, he found himself falling into drug addiction, which left him feeling lonely, depressed, and totally hopeless. And then one day, while sitting on a park bench, a, a group of religious people started telling William about Jesus. And they invited him to come to their church to learn more. And because William was in such a desperate place in his life, he agreed, and he showed up at this church, and he listened to what was being taught. And that day, he felt a burning in his heart, and he said a prayer, and he joined the church. And now that William had some, some newfound purpose in his life, it motivated him to start making some changes. So he checked himself into rehab and was able to overcome addiction. He rejoined the workforce, and in a short amount of time, started making good money. Even met a woman. They got married. He started serving in the church. He started giving lots of money to the church. He even became an elder at the church. And when William died, he stood before Jesus, ready to come in heaven. Jesus looked him right in the eyes and says, depart from me, I never knew you. And for an eternity, William was locked out of heaven. How can this be? Here's how. William had a wrong view of Jesus and a wrong view of self. Because the church that he started going to began to teach that Jesus was just a man. A man who worked really hard to achieve perfection. And here's the view of self. That if you work really hard, you too could achieve perfection. And that's exactly what William did. He just started working for it. And the scariest part is William, the entire time, thought he was a Christian until it was too late. Jesus tried to warn us about this very thing. This is what he said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? You know, religious stuff. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. We have to have the right view of Jesus in order to be a Christian, in order to gain entrance into heaven. And so what is the right view of Jesus? We have to know who he is and what he's done. And so let's, again, look to God's word. There's a lot of places that describe Jesus, uh, but here's one of my favorites. This is from the Apostle Paul in in Colossians 1. Listen to these words. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. In short, (laughs) Paul said, Jesus is God himself, the visible representation of the invisible, that Jesus created everything, though he himself was uncreated, that Jesus was there before humanity ever came into the picture, though Jesus himself became a human, so that he could lay his life down for the world on the cross. That's the real Jesus, the biblical Jesus. Friends, words matter, but the meaning of the words matter even more. And you can hear Jesus' name thrown all around. But if it's not in line with what the Bible says, it ain't true. That's who Jesus is. As for what he's done, let's go to the Gospel of John. John 19, verse 16. Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. Crucifixion was a horrible way to die. You actually had to pull yourself up to catch a breath. And the, and the way the Romans nailed the, the hands and feet made it excruciating for the body to even be able to do that. And eventually it just gave out and you couldn't pull yourself up anymore and you die of suffocation. And as Jesus was nearing the end, this happened, verse 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. You know another way to say that? Paid in full. (laughs) What did Jesus pay? He paid for the sins of the world. Sin is anything that falls short of God's perfect standard. Look at it like this. Let's say somebody hands you a credit card with no limit, and you just start using this credit card for everything. You're you're paying off the car. You're buying groceries, Netflix, Disneyland, jewelry, clothing, swipe, 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 and that bill keeps coming, but you keep pushing it off, saying, hey, one of these days I'll get around to paying it, until you realize that the debt has gotten too big and then the creditors show up. And you say, sorry, I don't have the money. Yeah, that excuse don't work with creditors. They're gonna start taking something because someone has to pay for this. Sin is the same way. Whenever you and I do anything that is, falls short of the perfect standard of God, we're racking up a debt. And over the course of our lives, it, it's a debt that we can never, ever pay back. And we get to a point where we say, there's there's nothing I can do about it. I can't pay this debt off. And that's when Jesus steps in and says, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for the whole thing. 
You see, when Jesus went to the cross, his sinless body absorbed all the sins of the world, past, present, and future. And when I place my faith in Jesus, I get the deal of the century. Jesus gets all my debt, and in exchange, I get his debt forgiveness. And he's gifting this to anyone. And you should be suspicious because you know nothing in life is free. That's true. This wasn't free. Jesus had to pay for it. He paid with his own life. Who wouldn't take a deal like that? That's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus does. That's the real Jesus. You have, you have to have the right view of Jesus. And the second thing is we must have a right view of self. You know, the prevalent belief in our culture is that people are generally born good. We have to learn how to, how to do bad things. But the message of the Bible is totally different. So that sin actually started with the first humans, Adam and Eve. When Adam disobeyed God, sin spread into all of us. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says it in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. He says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone. For who sinned? Everyone. This is the message of the Bible. You say, well, that doesn't seem fair. Why should I be penalized for something somebody else did? Look at it this way. Imagine all of humanity was on a giant boat, and it was being steered by Adam, the captain. And rather than following the course God set out for him, he decided to go his own course, and he drifted and steered the boat right into some jagged rocks, and the entire thing flipped over, and all of humanity was tossed into the water, where we're now drowning. That is the picture of humanity. Was it my fault that Adam steered into the rocks? No, but I feel the effects of his decision. And so all of us are born in those waters. We're not born in the safety and and the security of the boat. We're born in the waters. And so how would God respond to the mistake Adam made? He sent a second Adam to clean up the mess the first Adam started. Paul continues, verse 18. Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. Jesus is the second Adam. And he came to fix what Adam broke. See, Adam brought death. Jesus brought life. Adam brought the problem. Jesus brought the solution. Adam brought sin. Jesus brought salvation. And so with all of humanity in the water, Jesus pulls up in a rescue boat and he starts throwing ropes out into the water saying, grab on and I'll I'll pull you to safety. And then for us to have a right view of self means to say, I actually can't get out of this water on my own. I need help. Jesus, I don't know what I would have done if you didn't throw me the rope. And so I'm I'm believing in faith that you and you alone are gonna save me. The wrong view of self is when the rope lands right in front of us. We say, no, I'm good. I think I can get out of this on my own. I'm not actually drowning. I'm just drifting. Let me just grab onto something to keep me afloat until I eventually wash up on some shore somewhere. And this is what most people believe. And all it takes is one person to convince you otherwise. Like, hang on, everybody. Let's not go crazy with the ropes. Okay, first of all, we don't know who this Jesus is. We don't know where that rescue boat is going. And, and look, after all, all of my friends are in here anyway. I, I think I'm going to take my chances in the water. Who's with me? And without fail, the majority of people are going to hang in the water. Because we believe that at the end of the day, we'll figure it out. A right view of self is, no, I actually can't save myself. Friends, if you want to be a Christian, there is some essential things that need to be in place. A right view of Jesus, a right view of self. I want to give it to you in an equation. I want you to write this down. I want you to commit it to memory. Heck, you could even tattoo it on your body. And here is the equation. 
Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. It's not Jesus plus my good works. It's not Jesus plus my rituals. It's not Jesus plus my own path. It's Jesus plus nothing. I can't save myself. The only thing I contribute to my salvation is the sin that put Jesus on the cross. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. What's the everything? We we get all the spiritual blessings in Jesus, the biggest of which is that the greatest problem any of us will ever face has been dealt with, and that's eternal separation from God because of our sin. I mean, this is a problem that lingers over humanity. We don't want to think about it. We want to put it off. We want to stuff it down, but eventually that bill is coming. But when you place your faith in Jesus, the greatest problem any of us will ever face is lifted. That means any other problem we face after that is secondary to the greatest one. And if Jesus could take care of the greatest one, he could take care of the other problems I have too. I could trust Jesus with my cancer. I could trust Jesus with my loneliness. I could trust Jesus with my anxiety. I could trust Jesus with my depression. I could trust Jesus with my doubt because he's already taken care of the greatest problem I have. And so I'm I'm giving it all to you. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. You gotta believe that to be a Christian. But remember, it's more than just belief. I wanna read again what happened in Antioch, Acts 11, 21. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So what does that mean? Here's what it means. It is possible to believe all the right things about Jesus and still not make it into heaven. How do I know this? Jesus' brother addressed this very issue, James 2.19. He says, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God? Good for you. Even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. If you ever watch the interactions of Jesus and the demonic world in the Gospels, it's pretty fascinating. Jesus walks into the room and they drop to their knees and they they start confessing things that even Jesus' worst enemies wouldn't confess. They say things like, have mercy on me, son of David. Or what have you come to do to us, son of God? In In one instance, one even said, have you come to torture us before the appointed time? Demons believe that Jesus is God that he's ruler over all, and that they are totally under his ultimate control. Demons believe the right things about Jesus, but it does not save them. Why? Because they never acted on this. They made their choice. They rebelled against Jesus. How about you? To turn to Jesus is a combination of believing and acting. I've heard it said that most people will miss heaven by 18 inches, the difference between the head and the heart. And so what it means to turn, this this is where we get our our word for repentance. It's a word you might hear a lot. And, And repentance can be a confusing thing, but the idea is that I'm experiencing a change of mind. I'm not doing things the same way I've always done. And this is this is Jesus' whole mission. There was once a situation where Jesus was, was eating a meal with tax collectors. And tax collectors were like the most reviled people around. They, they, they victimized their own people to make themselves rich. They were so hated that their fellow Jews wouldn't even refer to them as Jews. And yet there's Jesus munching it away at the dinner table. And so the religious leaders, they, they started chastising Jesus. And, and here was his response in Luke chapter 5, verse 31. Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus didn't come here to just have a conversation with us. Jesus didn't come here to just be a moral example so he could just get us. Jesus' mission is to call sinners to repentance, to change our ways. In one statement, Jesus offended everybody in the room. He offended the religious leaders because he called them out publicly. Then he offended all the tax collectors. Like, wait, are you saying I'm a sinner? Jesus is like, yes. And it's very hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven, especially when they get rich off a dishonest gain. Can you pass the hummus? 
I mean, that, that's how Jesus interacted with people. He says, I'm telling you, you're on the wrong road. And it's time to get on the right road. And so sometimes we get confused about what repentance is and what repentance is not. So I want to give you a couple of things that it is not, and then I'm going to share with you what I believe it is. So here's a couple of things repentance is not. Repentance is not saying words, praying a prayer, signing a card, and then going back and living exactly how I was living. Repentance is not feeling bad. When you and I sin, it doesn't feel great. That's called good old-fashioned guilt, and it always wears off. That's not repentance. Repentance is not coming clean. It's good to get things off your chest. It's better for you to to confess. People have been doing this for centuries with Catholic priests. I'll go to confession, I'll, I'll come clean, and then I'll go back to doing the very thing that made me feel bad in the first place. Repentance is not working more. You know, we see this often with, with uninvolved parents. <laughs> you know, like a, like a dad who keeps letting his kids down with all these unmet promises. So what does he do? He takes the kids on a shopping spree as if to make up for all the other things. And, and Christians do the same thing with God. Like, I, I really feel bad, bad, God. I feel like I keep letting you down. So now I'm gonna sign up for the Bible study. I'm gonna serve. I'm gonna come to church. I'm gonna give money as if this is gonna change how God feels about us. And while those things are healthy, it's not repentance. One more, repentance is not surrendering some. Living with one foot in and one foot out. Imagine if I said to my wife, Kate, this year, I'm gonna be faithful to you 99% of the time. If there's 100 chances to have an affair, I'm only gonna act on one of them. 99%, that's a great grade in school, right? It's not a great grade in marriage. And when you place your faith in Jesus, marriage is the closest metaphor we have. We, we, we become one with Christ. See, most people follow Jesus like they follow someone on Instagram. If he says something that they like, they give him a little heart. But if he says something they don't like, they dismiss him with the mere swipe of a thumb. Friends, we can't be living this one foot in, one foot out. Jesus calls us for full surrender. That's what repentance is. So so those are some of the things repentance is not. Let me give you a a simple way to understand what repentance is. It is simply faith in action. It's acting on what I believe. Let's put it like this. Uh, Let's say your best friend uh, just bought a house and they're inviting you over to come and see it. And so you get your little housewarming gift, you pile your family in the car and you set your GPS for their house. And right before you arrive, your GPS starts saying, turn right, but you go straight. It says, turn right, but you keep going straight. It says it again, turn right. Now, at this point, everybody in the car is yelling at you, turn right. You know, I mean, how many couples have had this exact argument? Would you just listen to the device? It knows better than you. And I'm guessing that most of the people behind the wheel were men. <laughs> the thing keeps saying, turn right, but you never do. Now, you could believe with all your heart that your friend's house is on the right. But if you don't actually turn, you're not going to get there. See, repentance is seeing if I'm on a road that is not leading to Jesus, I got to turn and get on the road that is. I got to actually put my faith into action. See, here's what's interesting about deconstruction. See, nobody really stands above the rubble of a faith. See, deconstruction is actually not even possible because whenever we're deconstructing one thing, we're reconstructing another. When I'm pulling apart the blocks of Christianity, I'm just replacing them with something else. So the the, the biblical view of sexuality, no, I, I believe that I should be able to love whoever I want to love and do whatever I want to do with whoever I want to do it with. There's a new belief system. You know, and, and yeah, I don't, I don't think the Bible is for us anymore, and so I believe that we just need to rely on our own opinions. 
And so I, I've got plenty of those. I think that, you know, we should be activists and I think that we should be able to do what we want with our own bodies. And uh, I have a whole lot of other thoughts and really what these are are just my opinions or just what the echo chambers of YouTube and TikTok tell me. And what we're doing is we are just simultaneously deconstructing and reconstructing a new faith system. You know what repentance is? It's looking at this and saying, hang on, the chief cornerstone in this building is me. And if I want to become a Christian, as the Bible says it, I got to look at this thing that I built and say, no, 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 we're not doing that. I'm going with the chief cornerstone. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And so moving forward, everything else I believe and everything else I do is built in reference to Jesus. We're gonna get more into that next week. But for the sake of this, we're talking about what it takes to just make it into heaven. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus himself said this in John 5, 24. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins for they have already passed from death into life. I have to wonder if there's some in here who have never made that choice to truly follow Jesus. You're still flailing in the waters and the rope has been thrown to you from Jesus. And if I don't believe that I need to be rescued, I'll never have a need for a rescuer. Or I could look at that rope and just say, I absolutely believe that this is the only way that I'm gonna be saved. But if I don't reach out and grab a hold of it, I'm still in the water. At some point, I gotta clutch onto that rope with all I got and say, Jesus, I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting that your death on the cross paid for my sins in full. And when you place your faith in Jesus, it says you cross from death to life. And that someday when you get to the end of this life, you're gonna stand before almighty God. And when he pulls up your name on the computer, he's not gonna see a scrolling list of sins. He's gonna see three words, paid in full because of what Jesus did. And if you've never made a decision like this, well, there's no time like the present. I wanna help you make that decision today. And each week, I, I lead us into prayer and I, I try to tell us, listen, these are just empty words unless you're willing to act upon them. And I wanna give you that opportunity again. I wanna invite everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes and consider where you are. Have you crossed from death to life through faith in Jesus? If not, I wanna challenge you in faith to pray these words today. You could just repeat these after me in the silence of your own heart. Just tell them, Jesus, I give you my life. Tell them in faith, Jesus, I give you my life. I cannot save myself. But I believe you died on a cross for my sins. And I believe you rose again. So I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of all my sins. And I ask that you change my heart so I can get off the road away from you and get on the road that leads toward you. From this day forward, I want to follow you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to encourage you to take action. Here's an easy way to do it. On the program you received when you came in, there's a little perforated card at the bottom. And there's a box on there that says, I said yes. I want, you, I want to encourage you, fill that out. And in just a moment, our usher's gonna come to collect today's offering. You just drop that card right in the bag and one of our staff people will reach out to you and make contact. Answer the phone when it rings. Answer the text when it dings. Take action. Don't just let this be a moment.
Maybe you've already prayed to receive Jesus, but you're just kind of not really going anywhere and you want to take your next step. Here's an easy way to do that. Text the word next to 909-281-7797. One of our staff people will exchange a few messages with you and help you get better plugged in. We've got Rooted starting up in a couple of weeks. Or maybe you want to just get to, get to serve or get to know some other people or you just want somebody to talk to or assistance of some kind. Text next to 909-281-7797. Or there's a next step table right in our lobby and there's somebody standing there right now who is ready to answer any question that you may have. Text next, take that next step. Next week, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about those who've already prayed to receive Jesus, but yet their life doesn't look anything different. Did they lose their salvation? Maybe they never had it to begin with. Maybe they didn't lose the faith, they just lost their way. That's what we're gonna address next week. Be thinking of who you can invite with you to hear this powerful word from God. Until then, let's remember, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. We must have the right view of Jesus. We must have the right view of self. Let's believe and turn to the Lord. This is what it means to be a Christian. You believe it? Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for not just leaving us in the water, but for sending Jesus to rescue us. And I pray that there not be anybody in here who's trying to get out on their own and work their way out of it. But Lord, I pray that they would reach out and grab the rope and be pulled to safety, to be saved from their sins. I pray for those who've been deconstructing their faith, maybe starting or deep into it or walking with somebody who's doing the same. Lord, I pray that today they would make a turn to get off that road and to a road that leads towards you as the chief cornerstone. And Father, as we continue to worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings, Lord, I pray that this, this act would, would be one that's generous and done with cheerful hearts and that you take this money and use it to, to reach others all over this nation and world. Lord Jesus, we're, we're totally lost without you. And so we simply cry out and say, thank you for the rescue. We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you believe it in your heart, then let the church say, amen. amen.